Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again to the COPEC Daily Financial Webcast. As you may know by now, we start at 2 o'clock almost every day, excepting maybe holidays. And we have a guest speaker, and again, we're going to have Jill Spradlin back with us today, and we're excited about that. So the program will last from 2 to 2.30, and then we have question and answers. We'll kind of keep the lines open uh, as late as, as 3 o'clock. Um, Jay Leonard is also a host at times, but uh, I'm going to be your host today. And uh, as I think we've mentioned in the past, um, some of the speakers that we have are in the financial service business and also act are a part of COPEC and on the board of uh, directors of COPEC. So we are going to show you this uh, disclosure and I'm going to be quiet for a minute so that you can look that over and uh, then I'll, I'll rejoin you. Well, thank you for your patience. Um, some of you may be new with us, so I wanted to mention, of course, that these programs are sponsored by COPEC, stands for the Central Ohio Professional Education Council. It is a nonprofit 501c3, and our sole mission is to provide educational opportunities like we're doing today. And there's no attempt at sales, so you can be comfortable uh, to just soak up the good education. So these are live uh, stream programs. Uh, and we do broadcast daily, of course, except for holidays, as I mentioned. Feel free to share these programs if you're a part of an uh, organization or part of a company, part of a nonprofit. Feel free to, to pass along these educational programs if you think it will help others as well. And occasionally we do have uh, difficulties with technology, so if that is to occur, please bear with us and we'll try to get those corrected as soon as possible. On the right side here, we've listed many of the speakers that you will have an opportunity to hear from uh, throughout the, the uh, year. And also we invite you to go into financialeducation.org. That is our website. It's listed many times throughout the program. And you'll see six different tiles uh, on, on the website and it will tell you a variety of educational information that's available to you. Obviously, the one tile is the daily program, and we do schedule these far in advance, so you can go month by month and see what programs are coming up. We'd love to have you join us every day, but uh, you may want to uh, put your sights on just certain programs of, of high interest to you. And then, of course, uh, like I said, you can look month by month uh, it's an example here in August and see who's coming up. Tomorrow we have uh, a very good program as well with Mike Schettinger. He's going to be joining us tomorrow. Uh, and so please, uh, please join us for that as well. Another tile talks about retirement decisions. That's kind of an in-depth workshop that we provide for people who may be close to retirement within five years normally. And we get in depth on the whole area of retirement and all the different issues that come into play. So we have some of those at the Fawcett Center. Uh, with the coronavirus, we may be uh, relying on Zoom programs uh, to deliver those as well. Uh, Financial Wellness Fridays is another tab that you'll want to be aware of and go in and look at those programs. Those are lecture type series. And uh, again, we can get into some of these topics in much more depth. They usually last about 50 minutes in nature. Um, and then scheduling uh, educational programs, like I said, if you have an organization where you would like to have some focused attention with your group, uh, please let us know and we can, uh, we can uh, schedule those as well. Now, very importantly too, another tab is to sign up for or request a 15 minute no cost consultation so that you can ask individual questions, maybe questions that are a little bit more personal in nature. And so that is another tab that uh, we invite you to, to have access. 
So getting to our current topic today, which is current topics actually, and Jill Spradlin will be uh, joining us at this time. Uh, she is, of course, a CPA, owns her own company, and has a uh, staff right here in Dublin, Ohio, as well as London, Ohio. So, Jill, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point, and thank you for joining us, and let us know what you're going to talk about today. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I, I thought we'd discuss a couple of topics today. The um, itemized deductions that will be available to employees and to taxpayers in general for 2020 tax returns uh, so people can um, start preparing for that and planning accordingly. And then also wanted to discuss a little bit about the situation with the payroll tax cut that's been um, apparently enacted by executive order and what that means, how that works and what that's going to mean for folks um, for this year. So. Great. There's always plenty in the tax and accounting world to uh, to keep up to date with. So we appreciate that. That's true. Okay. I thought we'd start with some deduction um, information. As you're probably aware, um, itemized deductions are um, deductions that individual taxpayers may take, and those are compared to a standard deduction that everyone receives. And generally speaking, you take the higher of the two amounts to maximize your tax savings. Um, over time, some of the uh, allowed categories of deductions have changed, and that's taking place again this year a little bit. So we just wanted to go over what folks can and can't do um, for, on their 2020 tax return. And Jill, let me ask this too. Do most tax preparers kind of look at things both ways? from the standpoint of looking at itemizing, whether they can itemize or take the standard? Yes, yes. And in, in fact, um, tax programs are um, set to automatically do that as well. And then in okay. general, um, we, we usually try to ask a series of questions to determine if somebody has enough medical deductions, for instance, or um, some of the other categories to, um, to benefit from itemizing. Uh, the 2018 tax law greatly increased the standard deduction amount. It basically doubled the standard deduction amount from about 6,000 to about 12,000 um, per individual or double that on a married filing joint return. So many more people um, were just taking the standard deduction uh, beginning in 2018 than previously. So fewer people are itemizing but there are still instances where it's very beneficial. So, very good. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got a few changes that go back to the 2018 law. Um, one, of the, one of the downsides was that most employee business expenses were done away with. Um, in the past, uh, if someone was a W-2 employee and they had to personally pay some of their business expenses, perhaps a cell phone, usage of their own car, things like that, they were able to claim those expenses as miscellaneous itemized deductions on their personal tax return. The uh, tax law enacted in 2018 basically did away with those. Um, hopefully that has caused some employers to take a look at maybe reimbursing the employee uh, for the expenses because the employer would still be able to deduct those expenses where the employee now cannot, so the deduction is lost if they're not reimbursed in some manner. Um, the, some of the other deductions, the medical expense um, is often very confusing because the medical expense total itself, and this is for out-of-pocket costs as well as insurance premiums and so on, um, those have to exceed seven and a half percent of the taxpayer's adjusted gross income. And that's a fairly high threshold to meet. So um, before it's the portion above that percentage that gets to be added into the itemized deductions. Um, Jill, did that go up? Did that go up to ten percent at one time? It it was discussed. I, I believe it did go up maybe in twenty seventeen and went back down, but it's currently hmm. seven and a half percent. And that's the same for all ages. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and so the expenses that are allowed under that are premiums that in, including Medicare premiums or Medicare, uh, 
the um, supplemental programs, uh, out-of-pocket doctor, hospital um, prescription costs, mileage to medical appointments, um, and some medical devices and equipment. Uh, separately, the premiums for long-term care insurance, if you have a long-term care policy, those may be um, taken as an itemized deduction. Uh, in addition to the medical, another big category is um, mortgage interest, home mortgage interest. Um, and that usually is, we find it to be the, usually the determinator on whether someone's going to itemize or not. If they have a, a mortgage with a fairly high balance and pay a significant amount of um, mortgage interest, that along with property taxes usually will push them into itemizing. Um, it's not so much, the, the other category is charitable and, and a fewer number of people are, that are very generous charitably uh, go over the threshold because of charitable donations that they make. So those are kind of the two biggest categories that will determine whether somebody even uh, is even close to exceeding the standard deduction or not. Um, the, the new tax law that was enacted to do with COVID um, does allow charitable deductions of up to 100% of income. So that is um, more generous than it was previously to encourage donating. And in addition, the 2020 returns are going to allow a so-called above the line deduction of $300 of charitable deductions. So even if you, a taxpayer does not itemize, they would be able to take advantage of that above the line charitable deduction. That's gonna be helpful to a lot of people, I'd imagine. Yes, yes, yeah. because a lot of people um, otherwise, because their total amount of de deductions doesn't exceed the standard, they don't really get any tax benefit from doing any charitable donations. So that will be helpful. Um, in addition to the medical expenses and the mortgage interest, there are some additional miscellaneous deductions such as gambling losses to the extent of winnings. So if you have gambling winnings, which are taxable, you may deduct losses to the extent of those winnings as an itemized deduction. Hmm. This doesn't unfortunately affect the taxability on a state level, so you still pay state and local taxes on those winnings, but it can offset the winnings for federal purposes if you have enough deductions to itemize deductions. Um, there are also losses for casualty and theft. If you experience a loss through a fire, flood, um, or uh, through a Ponzi scheme, for instance, if, if you are um, uh, suffer from a, a victim of a, a scheme such as that, that uh, unfairly uh, basically is, you know, taking income from you, that can be deducted as an itemized deduction through the um, casualty and theft losses program. Uh, home office is still available if you uh, have a business. It is not available to employees, again, because employee business expenses in general were um, done away with. Uh, club dues, those, those kinds of things get a little um, specific. Uh, certain types of club dues, certain types of meals and expenses can be deducted. There's discussion about restoring 100% meal deductions um, for business lunches and things, but that has not taken place yet in the current law. Um, fines and penalties, things like that, are generally not deductible with some specific exceptions. Uh, generally speaking, if you have a fine for late payment of a tax, or if you have a traffic ticket, none of those kinds of things are actually deductible. Uh, nor are uh, donations to political campaigns and political candidates. Uh, the state of Ohio allows a small deduction for a contribution to a campaign. I believe it's $50 per taxpayer. Um, so they allow a modest deduction, but the federal law does not allow for any deduction of those kinds of things. A lot of folks will find um, lump this in with charitable, their charitable donations because they mistakenly assume that those are deductible, um, but they are not. Um, in addition, other undeductible things 
or commuting expenses. So when people claim mileage, that has to do with mileage to a, a place other than your fixed place of work. So a trip from your home to your regular place of work is never deductible, whereas a trip to maybe a client's site might be deductible if you have a small business or something. Um, again, the fines and the penalties generally are not. Uh, lobbying expenses to influence legislation or to participate in political campaigns are generally not deductible as well. Some of the um, other loss deductions have been um, other employee business expenses. People used to take a portion of their cell phone if they used their own phone or if they used the, some of their home internet or uh, telephone expenses and had a home office. As an employee, they were allowed to deduct part of that as an itemized deduction and those have been taken away and that hurts some some folks pretty badly certain types of jobs tend to have the employee operate a home office uh, many employers are actually having more and more employees work from home at least part of the time and so that one um, stay tuned on that I think a lot of people objected to that going away and may want to revisit that if they discuss tax law again um, obviously, at the moment, the large um, things have to do with the COVID pandemic and ways of trying to um, mitigate some of the effects of that. Uh, currently, Congress is, seems to be on a, a, at an impasse and is, is not even meeting at the moment on, on uh, passing any additional legislation. Uh, they will have to take that up again um, fairly soon, I would think. Um, they did pass uh, initially an extension or an, an addition to state unemployment programs and taxpayers should be aware that those benefits are taxable. Um, hopefully they have arranged for a portion of their unemployment benefit if they're receiving such to have um, taxes withheld from that because those benefits are taxable. And Jill, maybe you're, maybe you're speaking to this, but with some of these um, tax favored benefits because of the virus. Are people going to be caught surprised in terms of taxes owed for any they, reason? Is that they may be. Um, they may be. If they're not aware, uh, if they've not previously dealt with unemployment and some folks aren't aware that that's a taxable benefit, uh, people get it confused sometimes with workers' compensation, which is not taxed, but unemployment is. And with these uh, additional, more generous federal benefits, the, obviously the, the weekly payments are larger and are gonna result in more of a tax bill, perhaps than people expect. Um, the uh, economic stimulus payment that people received, the uh, $1,200 per adult and $500 per dependent child, those will not be taxed. So that will not be considered taxable income. Um, however, people should understand that that was, that was an estimate it, based on 2018 or 2019 tax filings and will ultimately be based on your 2020 income. So there are folks who perhaps didn't qualify for the stimulus uh, based on their 2018 or 2019 returns but will qualify once they file their 2020 return and would receive the stimulus at that time if they had not before. Um, in addition, if there were, say, a college student who had been claimed as a dependent on their parents' return in 2018 or 2019 and therefore received no, received no stimulus payment, um, if they then file and claim themselves on their 2020 return, they would belatedly receive a stimulus payment as well. So there will be some changes to that. Uh, it, generally speaking, if there were an overpayment um, of the stimulus payment based on the prior years, that won't be um, requested to be repaid anyway. Uh, people who did receive payments in error uh, made out to people who had passed away were asked to return those checks. So hopefully they've done that. Um, the 
the additional stimulus payment that they're discussing now, they haven't, well, they, first of all, they haven't determined an amount or a, a method for distributing such, but if they do, uh, it's a fairly good guess. I, I suppose that it will be treated the same way as the first one, but that's not been determined yet. So all of that is still very much up in the air. Um, the uh, other thing that they've discussed is additionally increasing uh, or continuing a, an increase to the basic state unemployment with additional federal monies. And that would um, also be a taxable benefit just as, as the previous $600 per week addition was. Uh, whether that's each smaller in amount, uh, I believe now they're discussing 300 to 400 dollars a higher benefit weekly benefit than the norm um, but that all would be taxable income to the recipient okay so some changes there now there was an executive order um, the president signed an executive order august 8th to um, allow employees not to have to pay their share of uh, so-called payroll taxes, which is Social Security and Medicare on their wages. Uh, if an employee made 4,000 or less per week, they, per week, yeah, bi-weekly, bi-weekly I think it was, um, they would not have to remit those payroll taxes. However, it would be a deferral and not uh, an elimination of those. Uh, so how that would work, who would pay it, and when it would be due is also up in the air. Uh, there's a lot of questions about what would happen if that employee changes jobs or works more than one job or, you know, things of that nature because normally the employer withholds that tax and then remits it. So if the employer, if the employee opts not to have that tax paid at this time and the employer does not therefore withhold it so that the employee has a larger net paycheck, um, then when the time comes to remit that, if the employee has left their employment or something like that, there are questions about, well, you know, how is that, how are that, that going to be repaid and by whom? So there are a lot of open questions with that just recently in that enacted order and, and none of those things are settled either. So right now the news is <laughs> stay tuned and um, <laughs> you know we'll, we'll, all, we'll all find out hopefully soon how all of this is going to shake out. But Exactly. Did you have any other questions about the um, just the recent negotiations they're doing? Um, maybe back on charity, there's a question um, for those that have the standard deduction, but they're also of the age where they have to take required minimum distributions. Um, I know, I believe there's a suspension of the necessity, at least this year, to take those distributions. But I think the question revolved around if they still wanted to make a charitable contribution, um, is that a possibility? It is. It is. Okay. They can have that directed to the charity. And so I, so I believe they need to just consult with their custodian of that IRA? Correct. They would tell the payer um, of the IRA that they wanted to do that. Um, there, there's, there was also a provision that you can withdraw up to $100,000 um, mm have taken early withdrawal from a 401k plan or, or retirement plan uh, if you've been affected by the virus, if you yourself have been uh, become ill with the COVID virus or a family member, or if you were laid off due to it and such, you could take an early distribution from one of those plans without the normal 10% early withdrawal penalty. Right. So we probably should mention that as well. Okay. Um, we try to remind our clients as well, and, and maybe you have a thought on this, but with the current tax legislation that's in force now, tax brackets, and uh, that is due to, if nothing gets extended, that's due to what expire 
I forget which year it is. The sunset in 2025, yes. Okay. And so everything would return to the pre-2018 laws and limits. And this could largely depend on the outcome of the election and whatnot, but uh, it's a good reminder for all the individuals to be aware of that. Yes, try there's to, try to this plan. cliff in tax planning that, that is out there, yes. Yeah. Again, that's, we don't have a crystal ball, do we? But No. <laughs> <laughs> we wish we did different tax planning especially so and jill you and i talk about this sometimes because every so often it arises that about tax simplification and uh, everything from maybe the extreme of some people touting that you know your taxes can be done on a postcard but um again we don't have that crystal ball and i really haven't heard such talk lately but is there anything from your uh, insight from uh, CPA's point of view that you see yeah, any grounds? I've, I've heard crickets on that lately as well. I think everyone has their hands full dealing with more, maybe more immediate matters right now. The, the 2018 attempt to, re it actually just made the forms more confusing. It added more subschedules. And I noticed that uh, several of those only continued in that one year and then were discontinued and the 2019 filing looked more like previous years had. It was uh, more like previous years than it was like the 2018 form. Um, I don't, I can't imagine they're ever going to get to a postcard as long as they attempt to do a lot of um, social programming or engineering, if you will, mm -hmm. through the tax code. The, if, as long as they try to have a lot of incentives to do one thing or not do another um, and, and try to uh, incent that through the tax code, that's what drives a lot of that complication and a lot of the uh, little um, add-ons and things to keep it from being truly simple. So uh, I, you know, that's just kind of the way they've always approached it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't look at it as just a straight revenue program, it's very much about policy as well. So there you have the, the complications. Right. And the, the, the 10,000, what is it? 10,000 page tax code. Yeah. Well, um, this has been a strange year in many, many ways, but we've had some, uh, the, chances to defer the completion of our tax returns this year. Do you anticipate that going back to normal in terms of next year's filings? Yeah, I personally wouldn't look for it to be deferred again and for that to be really any kind of precedent. Um, the timing, because the COVID thing really ramped up in late February and March, uh, and that was right in the height of that tax filing season. And a lot of folks were being laid off and furloughed and, 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 and all these poor medical workers and such um, were just not even able to deal with filing. But that probably was a one-time occurrence. And I, it, fortunately, they, they didn't defer it any further. There was some talk of further deferring the 2019 deadline to October 15th or December 15th, which would have pushed that right up against the beginning of the 2020 filing season. And I'm not sure how helpful that would ultimately be to folks to, to have all that to deal with at once. So um, they, did, they did leave the deadline at July 15th. So most everyone, unless they filed an extension to October 15th, which has always been available, um, and, you know, probably 10% of people regularly do that or some lower figure like that. Uh, other than that, um, everybody's probably has filed and paid by now and hopefully we'll, um, we'll be back on the regular schedule next year. So. Right, right. Well, Jill, I think we've answered questions kind of as we went along here. I'll give people just another minute or so, but I'm going to um, continue here a little bit and see if we do have any questions coming in. 
And uh, just a reminder again that we broadcast daily at two o'clock. Um, Jay, or I should say Mike Schettinger, the CEO of Schettinger Funeral Homes and Cremation Services is gonna be with us tomorrow at two o'clock talking about prepaid funerals, whether you should have one, and if so, what are the varieties of uh, plans that are available. So, well, Jill, thanks so much again for, for joining us. I think we've addressed the questions at hand, and uh, look forward to having you back at a later time as well. Thanks, Jerry. Uh-huh, bye-bye.